Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about Class D power amplifiers. Quick reminder, a Class A amplifier is one where collector current flows 360 degrees in the cycle. So we have one output transistor. The efficiency, best case, is 25% for an RC coupled circuit. So that's the downfall. It's a simple circuit, but Lousy efficiency. Class B improves on this. We use two devices. IC flows 180 degrees. So one transistor takes care of positive half waves, the other takes care of negative half waves. This way there's really no idle. In the ideal Class B, the idle is at zero, whereas for Class A, idle is at 50% of maximum current. So it's always drawn power, even if you don't have a signal. Class B is much more efficient. Maximum theoretical again, 78.5%. But on the output section, it's easy enough in lab to get something that's better than 70%. Uh, there are some other classes, but sort of the big one these days is class D. Class D is unique. It's not using the transistor in the linear region. It's a switching device. So the current is either in saturation or it's in cutoff. All right, so this is the switching device. The nice thing is efficiency on this can be huge. We can be talking over 90% efficiency on the output end. So that's great. Now how do we get this efficiency? That's sort of the interesting question. How do we get this so high? Well, the trick is to minimize current and voltage both being sizable values at the same time. If you're going to draw a current in a class A or class B, because it's operating in the linear mode, you will have collector current and collector emitter voltage at the same time, except at the most extreme swing. In the case of the class D, the transistor is either in saturation or it's in cutoff. That's it, other than a transition between the two states. So when you're in saturation, yes, there's a huge current, but the collector emitter voltage is very, very small, maybe a tenth or two of a volt. When you're in cutoff, the voltage is huge, but the current is essentially zero. So again, the product of those two things is really small. Uh, this can be seen if we just do a little plot over here. And so here's time. Now on this axis will be uh, the current and the voltage. So you know, up here will be the, the saturation over here will be the, uh, the cutoff. What ends up happening is, and I'm going to sort of exaggerate the edges, you have a pulse like this. And that would be, let's say, the collector current. Or in the case of uh, a typical class D amplifier, would probably be like power FETs would be the drain current. Now, What's happening with the voltage? All right, so the voltage, VCE, is doing something like this. And here's the fun bit. If you multiply the two waves together, that's the power. So here we are in saturation, right? huge current, tiny little voltage. So it's going to give us a small power. Over here, where we have a uh, cutoff, current zero, really high voltage, that's also going to be zero for power. And all we really see is on this cross area, you can have a decent voltage and a decent current at the same time. So we get these sort of pulses, right? So that's the power dissipation. And basically it's the area under this curve that tells us the total power dissipation. Well, obviously if we can make a very fast device where these edges are very steep, very quick, good high frequency performance, these pulses of power are going to be very, very small. So the overall power dissipation is minimized. Now, if we think about that 
for a sec, right? What we're saying is we need a fast device Good rise and fall times. What's a fast device? You know, typical. Well, power fets. Power fets are great for this. So very often we'll see power FETs, enhancement mode type power fets being used here. Okay. How do we make, uh, make use of this idea? I mean, after all, I can't just, you know, run an audio signal in and just produce pulses. Like, what the heck is that? That's just gross distortion. Well, we're going to use something called pulse width modulation. Or PWM. All right, so that name, pulse width modulation. You know, modulation is basically controlling a parameter according to some intelligent signal. What we're going to do is produce a square wave or a pulse train. And the width of the pulses is going to be controlled by the intelligent signal. In our case, that's the audio signal. So that goes up and down. As that signal goes up and down, that pulse width changes, right? It gets fatter, gets skinnier, and so on and so forth. Now, in the process, as we do this, right, we keep this, this red area, the power, small. And what does that do? This represents the wasted power. This represents heat in the transistor. Keep that small. That's where the efficiency comes in, right? What you're not wasting. In other words, everything that's going to be useful is going to go out to the load. Now, to create this, to create this, this uh, variable duty cycle pulse wave, what we're going to do is get a comparator. Here's my audio input. Just a little comparison circuit. So this is basically a, a simple sort of analog to digital kind of thing. There's two inputs. Audio comes in on one, and on the other, we're going to put in a triangle wave. And it's going to compare these two. So whenever the audio is bigger than the triangle wave, whenever its amplitude is larger, we're going to get a high output here. All right, so this is a digital output, and this is just a high-low output. And as I said, that's going to correspond to saturation and cutoff. Um, and whenever the audio is less than the corresponding triangle wave, we're going to get the low output. That's it. The triangle wave that we're going to use has to be much higher than the highest audio frequency that we intend to amplify. All right, so frequency of triangle has to be much greater than the highest audio frequency. So for example, if we were going to do a hi-fi kind of thing, 20 kilohertz on the top end for the audio, the triangle wave might be 200 kilohertz, okay, maybe 10 times the size. And this triangle wave, the amplitude of the triangle wave, will be the full amplitude of the input. In other words, the maximum input, or close to the maximum input um, of the audio signal. Maybe just a smidge larger. But probably best if we draw what this looks like. And I will admit that the diagram in the book is way better than what I can hope to draw here. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw one cycle of uh, our input. I'm just going to use the sine wave. And now we take a look at the triangle wave that's coming along with this, right? So like I said, it's much, much higher. It's pretty much full amplitude. And you'll forgive my less than consistent drawing, I hope. <laughs> that was pretty crappy. <laughs> All right, close enough for government work. So wherever the audio signal is greater than the triangle wave, we produce a high output. So right in this area, right, um, what we find is that the triangle wave is bigger. So it's going to be a low output. In this area, the uh, audio signal is bigger 
So we're going to see a high output. And I'm just going to uh, put some little construction lines in here. All right, so higher here, lower here. And we just keep doing this. Now what you're noticing is that my less than beautiful pulse train here, the width of these pulses is changing. Right? In the first part where the signal was positive, pulses are really fat on the positive end. And now we're here, the pulses are getting, oops, went a little far with that one. More like that. That shouldn't be there. That should go up and then down. It should be a this should be a really skinny pulse right here. Sorry about that. More like that. Okay, so. You know, what you're seeing is, uh, I'll just try to sketch this out with just the red. So you're seeing something like this, right? When the signal is, is uh, close to midpoint, close to zero, you're seeing pretty much a 50% duty cycle waveform. When it's pretty high, when it's positive, we see a really fat, maybe an 80-90% duty cycle. When it's negative, big negative value, uh, we're seeing maybe like a 10 or a 20% duty cycle. So... You know, you might see something like this as the as the waveform you know, works its way through. So I think maybe this will be a little easier to see. So on and so forth. All right, so what does that get us? Well, here's the really cool thing. If you were to average this, right, if you look at the area under the curve, so basically a little integration, what you're going to derive from this is the original sine wave, right? So here there's a lot of area because you've got a big positive pulse. Here it's 50-50, so you're getting nothing, right? The positive and the negative cancel out. Over here, you've got really skinny positive pulses and big fat negative pulses. So this is going to wind up being negative. So you're going to wind up recreating that original sine wave. Mathematically, this pulse train contains, in its frequency spectrum, the original audio signal. It also contains a whole bunch of other higher frequencies from the switching. And if we can filter this, because that, that's what averaging is going to be doing, if we can filter this, we can get rid of those high frequencies from the switching, and we'll be left with just the original audio. So what we do then is we feed this signal, this pulse width modulated signal, to the output transistors. So they're just going to switch on and off full bore, right? Saturation cutoff, saturation cutoff. And um, then... You know, we're going to get big pulses like this, and then we just have to do some kind of filtering after it. Well, filtering this is not too bad to do. We can do that with a passive filter, something like this. All right, so here's our load, and I can just use an inductor and a capacitor. So the transistor would be right here, right? So this is the output feed. So this is uh, a standard low-pass filter. This will get rid of all the high-frequency crap from the... Uh, from the switching and we'll be left with just the audio right beautiful you know without this you're going to have uh, these pulses feeding your loudspeaker that's not good we want to get rid of this extra high frequency stuff okay the output configuration you know if you were going to do i'm not going to draw an entire driver circuit i'm just going to draw a little box over here and call it driver but if you were going to do something with uh, like a bipolar transistor
this would look kind of like um, what you would see with class B. Right, so there's your output. So from this point, you would have your uh, filter circuit. Now what happens when uh, the driver goes high, we would turn on this NPN. That right, current would flow like so into the load. And on the opposite, when this goes low, this transistor turns off, this transistor turns on, and we get current flow like that, right? So push-pull reaction, just like we have in a Class B. But it's fully on, fully off. So you can think of a load line that just has two endpoints, right? You're either up at saturation or you're, or you're at cutoff. Um, like I said, typically you'd be using FETs, so that output... You know, we would use um, E-type MOSFETs here. So typically you would see something more like this. And there's your output. All right, now, that's what we would call a, uh, you know, sort of a single-sided drive. What's very typical is uh, we would do a bridge drive or a bridge configuration. Yeah, I'm going to use NPNs just because they're easy, easier for me to draw. Um, essentially, what we would do is we would sort of double this up. By the way, you can also configure this. Um, I'm drawing... Um, an NPN and a PNP, an N channel, a P channel. It's also possible with the driver, uh, if you had a dual output, an inverting driver, you could use all of the same device. You could have just um, just N channel FETs out here for both the uh, push side and the, and the pull side. So that's covered in the book. But in any case, um, so I'm just going to draw this coming into our driver circuit like this. Um, what we would do is make sort of a mirror image of this. And send this back to the drive circuit. And inside here, oops, that's a minus, we would have our filter. So this would be double-sided. And the load would be bridged across these. Hence the name. And this is technically, we call this an H bridge. So here's what happens. The transistors turn on in opposite directions. So when this transistor is on, this transistor is on. And what will happen is we'll get a current flow that goes like that. Right, that's our positive pulse. And then, in the opposite case, it'll be these two transistors that'll turn on. So the current will go like that. And we get the opposite side. So what this ends up doing is it doubles the total amount of voltage you can get across the load. And of course, power is uh, a function of uh, voltage squared. So if you can double the voltage, you can quadruple the power. Beautiful. Okay, a couple of um, things to watch for on here. Um, we have an issue, a potential issue called shoot through. And what happens is, uh, if this transistor and this transistor, right, these pairs, or the same thing can happen over here, if when they turn on, um, if we're not careful about the timing of the pulses, we can have a, a short and a short that will produce a, a sort of a burst of current, right? The current sort of shoots through the devices. So what we sometimes do is the drive signals aren't perfectly in sync. In other words, they're not, they're not like um, this. What we would actually do is have a little dead space, right? 
a dead time or something like that, whatever they call it. So well, let's sort of stretch this out a little bit. Now, like right here, there's this time period okay, where neither transistor is on. And that'll prevent the, the current shoot through. All right. So that's the basic idea behind this. Um, the efficiency on this, like I said, goes way up. And in the process, what this does is, because you're not wasting the extra uh, power in the transistors, number one, your power supply itself can be smaller because right? you don't have to deliver as much power. But probably more importantly, there's a lot less power dissipated in the transistors. That means the transistors themselves run cooler. It also means they don't need as much in the way of cooling, like heat sinks. So the end result is you can make a circuit that is, for the same output power, physically a lot smaller and a lot lighter. You know, uh, in, in days of old, when we were running, you know, a 200, 250 watt per channel uh, audio amplifier with a Class B, you might be looking at, you know, uh, a 19 inch rack here that was maybe a several ra rack spaces high, you know, like yay high. And uh, that thing might weigh, you know, 40, 50 pounds. Today, you can go out and buy a, a class D amplifier that is, you know, half the size physically, just in terms of the case, but, you know, maybe the thing only weighs 15 pounds, 10 pounds, and it's producing, you know, two, 300 watts, no problem. So, this has a huge, huge series of advantages. It is a more complex circuit. There's no doubt about that. Um, but this efficiency is a huge thing, right? So just to remind you, um, it's this power curve that really does all the trick. We need fast devices, so power FETs are really good at that, right? We want that fast edge, fast rise and fall time, um, hence the power FETs. And we do need some kind of filtering. The, the switching frequency that we're going to he use here is, like I said, maybe an order of magnitude higher than the highest audio frequency. Or, and this doesn't have to be audio. You, know, you could have a direct motor drive using this too. Um, but you know, a lot of people ask about Class D audio amplifiers. They're very popular now, PA systems and bass players and whatnot. Um, so that's kind of what I'm focusing on. But you know, you, we, we do need some of this, this filtering here. Or otherwise, this, this high frequency uh, energy from the switching is going to get into the loudspeaker, right? That's this guy. And that's not going to be good because even though you can't hear it as a human, it's going to create distortion, which you can hear, and it's just going to heat up the loudspeaker. So what's the point in that? Okay. All right. So we have a lot of possibilities, single ended drive, bridge drive. There you go.